<clears throat> Hello, this is Toby Thaler, Vice Chair of the 36th District Democrats. We are now interviewing Taki Flavaris for a position on the King County Superior Court. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Taki Flavaris, he, him pronouns. Uh, I am currently a judge in King County Superior Court in Department 38. I was appointed to that role uh, last October, and I'm running now to retain my seat. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet with you all today and to introduce myself to this group. Let me start by uh, highlighting my background and values. I am a son of immigrants uh, from a small village in Greece that came to this country because they saw it as a land of opportunity, fairness, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and those are the values that motivated me to pursue a legal career and ultimately to become a judge. And uh, it's, it's something that I'm passionate about and those values drive me in all that I do as a judge. Uh, in terms of my legal experience, uh, there are two main components to uh, my work in the law leading up to becoming a judge. The first was uh, doing complex civil litigation first at k &L Gates and then uh, Pacifica Law Group where I became a partner uh, and my practice was focused on constitutional, governmental and policy issues. Uh, the second component of my legal career was my work with the Korematsu Center for Law and Equality at Seattle University School of Law. Um, there I put, uh, devoted my energies to working on uh, addressing racial bias in our justice system and especially in the criminal justice system. I also spent a year at the Washington Supreme Court as a law clerk and that is what got me very passionate about our state's judicial branch uh, and motivated me to, to join it. And so as a judge, I have two main goals. One is to maintain the integrity of our legal system. And the second is to work hard at continually improving it over time. Uh, and so I, I put in extremely hard work. I tried to be as prepared as possible uh, on every single case, but also to make sure that every litigant is fully heard, especially unrepresented litigants. And so, uh, again, back to those core values, that's what drives my work. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think the first question kind of follows from that. It's what is your understanding of access to justice and what steps are you taking to promote and foster it? Yes, that is, that is of prime importance and motivation to me as a judge. I think at a very high level, uh, access to justice means when disputes are resolved according to substantive law, not a given party's resources or abilities or undue biases against them. That's access to justice at a high level. Of course, the difficulty is figuring out what it means at a granular level and, uh, and, and putting in efforts to promote it as much as possible. As I said, you know, one, of my, one of my goals is to improve the system over time. So how do we do that? Uh, there's, there's various ways. I think two, two things I would highlight that our court system has done that I take great pride in are uh, improving clarity of court forms and then providing interpretive services. So those are two examples. Um, other things that I am currently working on uh, in, in my courtroom to promote access to justice are first of all, uh, fully engaging with parties to make sure that they are understanding the proceedings and are able to express themselves and to be fully heard. And uh, I'm very uh, supportive of recent amendments to the Code of Judicial Conduct, specifically comments that have now been codified that, that tell judges steps they should take to ensure that unrepresented parties can fully participate. So there's a list of different steps. They include things like explaining the standards that are being applied, inviting questions, uh, explaining the reasons for a given decision, and, uh, and minimizing legal jargon. So those are the types of things that I'm doing every single day in every single matter uh, to make sure that people understand uh, what is going on. Uh, and then a second example I'll give in terms of promoting access to justice is a new tool that was developed actually in King County Superior Court and has now been adopted statewide, which is the informal family law trial, which is something where uh, the, rule, the technical rules of evidence are put aside and, party, and the judge directs the proceedings. So it's a way to really get people in family court um, to, to navigate more effectively and to reach better resolutions. Thank you for that. Next question, Amanda. 
What are you doing or will you do to make newcomers or those whose primary language language is not English or those without legal status feel comfortable in your courtroom? Describe the steps you will take to ensure their right to due process is protected. Thank you very much. Um, as I noted at the outset, I'm a son of immigrants. So this one um, is very important to me, uh, making sure that everyone, you know, no matter their characteristics, no matter their background, in, in a court of law where disputes of any kind are being resolved, that they feel comfortable and able to navigate the proceedings and to, to be heard. Um, so that's extremely important. And I, I think few key ways that, that I'm focused on, on, on making that happen. One is the environment and culture of my courtroom. And so uh, I focus on creating an environment of inclusivity, of respect, and of empathy. Uh, and so I just mentioned uh, before these steps that judges can take to make sure unrepresented parties are uh, able to fully participate. Those same steps are, are important to making sure people of all backgrounds feel comfortable and understand the proceedings. Uh, and uh, another, another uh, step is uh, proactive enforcement, especially of rules that are, that are designed to promote access to justice. Um, so the court actively invoking rules such as uh, evidence rule 403, which is uh, a rule that was adopted in Washington courts uh, just a few years ago, where evidence of citizenship status cannot be admitted uh, except in certain rare cases where it's actually you know, extremely materially relevant. And so that's something where, for example, I as a judge will step in if if citizenship starts to be introduced. I you know don't wait for the parties to say something about it. The court has to step in and make sure those rules are adopted. And that goes again back to creating a culture, setting clear expectations, making sure everyone knows and is also uncomfortable uh, comfortable invoking such rules. And then uh, the last example here is, again, interpretive services, not just making sure they're provided, which our court has done a great job of moving ahead in that direction, but making sure every, extra time is allowed to make them effective and that everyone feels comfortable invoking them and, and, and that they are effective, including in the way the court is asking questions or making statements that are easily translatable. Thank you. Uh, Sherry, are you ready? Hey, um, can you tell us about a recent decision of the Washington Supreme Court that addresses racism? Are there steps courts can take to address racism or implicit bias in our court system and processes? Yes, there are. And this is uh, an issue that I devoted uh, much of my legal career to and that I care about a great deal. I think our, I'm very proud of our Supreme Court and uh, the work that it's been doing uh, in terms of prioritizing the issue, uh, addressing the issue of racial bias in our justice system. Um, and so I'm, I'm very happy to be part of Washington's judiciary for that reason. Rather than a particular case, I think there's, to me, a very important strand of cases, line of cases, um, where the court has been looking at different procedures that have existed for some time and asking whether racial bias might be at play and saying that we need to make sure it's not at play uh, in any of these different circumstances and invoking a very protective standard, specifically whether an objective observer could view race as a factor in, in something going on. That, that standard uh, was adopted in a court rule, General Rule 37, that, that deals with jury selection. I was actually part of the working group um, that helped refine that rule and pr propose it to the Washington Supreme Court, uh, and the, the court adopted it in 2018. And so the idea of the rule is to First of all, make identifying racial bias not a personal action, so not a judge saying to someone, you're being racist, is rather saying there's an appearance of fairness issue here. An objective observer could view this as a problem, so we need to do something about it. So it depersonalizes it. That's very important. The other aspect, the next aspect of the rule is that it defines the objective observer as someone who understands a hi the history of implicit bias, structural bias, other types of biases that have historically marginalized uh, groups based on race. Uh, so, so the objective observer knows that reality. And then the third is the, the could view piece of that standard that says, this is so important that if an objective observer could view race as infecting this process, then we have to do something about it. I think that line of cases is very important and uh, I think it will continue to develop. 
the last question will be asked by Ginny. Hi there. How much time do you give to educating the public about courts? Percentage of time or hours per month? It could include teaching in schools or talking to community groups. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think the ways that a judge can improve the legal system, which I mentioned earlier, um, th there are a number of them. And it's not just deciding cases. It's, again, how you set up your courtroom environment and culture. Uh, it's also court rules and procedures and how those are developed for the, for the entire court system. And then it's also engaging the community and, and, and trying to make sure that the community understands and respects the separation of powers and the different branches of government, including the judicial branch and process. And so engagement, public engagement is something that I um, did across my legal career regularly. It's something that I plan to continue doing as a judge. Uh, I've been at this for about half a year. Uh, I was quickly assigned to um, one of the highest volume uh, rotations on the court and in a context that was new to me, which is family court. And so I have been um, essentially singularly focused on being as effective as possible as a judge uh, in family court and not only understanding the, that, that legal framework, but also ensuring that the members of the public that come before me in those cases fully understand the process, uh, the decisions that are being made and the like. Now that I've become more acclimated, uh, I am now expanding my horizons and starting to engage in, in other activities. I just had my first public presentation uh, as a judge last month, uh, which was actually on the issue of racial bias in, in the legal system and some of the things that I was talking about earlier. Um, and it was very satisfying and uh, reminded me of why I so much appreciated the opportunity to do that as a lawyer. Uh, and so I plan on continuing to do that. And rather than set a amount of time or percentage for me, it's just always having something. So always having a next piece of engagement that I'm going to be doing and focusing on the quality of that rather than quantity and volume or some, some particular amount of time. That's my philosophical approach. But I, that is one of the things that I actually most appreciate about this opportunity to, to be a judge and to engage with the community and serve the community. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's the end of the regular questions. Uh, I, we have about eight minutes left and uh, we have follow-up questions and people can ask you to continue what you've been talking about or others. I look for a hand, there's Amanda. Hi, uh, thank you. Yeah, you um, you talked a lot about your great lived experience and professional experience um, in the area of dealing with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, bias and equity in the court system. I was wondering if you could talk about specifically what you do in terms of ongoing education of yourself to deepen your understanding or broaden your understanding of these issues as a, as a judge. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that question. And I think that's, uh, that's a, such an important aspect of being a judge is not stopping, continuing one's education and understanding of the world uh, to be as further along as and what can be. And it's true of everyone, really. And uh, one thing I have always uh, taken great pride in is continuing to learn through different, different sources of information. So anecdotal lived experiences, uh, psychological science, you know, those are just two examples engaging in those things. But as a judge now, I'd say a few key pieces of focus are one, uh, staying up to speed with, by reviewing uh, our administrative office of the court's publications. That's a really important source for me. I think our court has done an excellent job of having various committees and task forces that look at pressing issues and then, and then consolidate a lot of extremely important information and how courts can improve and, and what steps the courts are looking at to improve. And then the other, I know I ran out of time, I'll just really briefly say, in court, hearing from experts on issues and sometimes even calling for expertise, especially in family court. Sometimes we have to call for an evaluator or another expert to come in and, and help guide us and give us more information. So I definitely emphasize that as well. So both in court, but then also outside of court. I will ask a forward question. Should trees have standing? All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer it in two different ways. One is to say, 
I, I, I am aware that the issue of standing and non-traditional forms of standing um, is making its way through courts, has been addressed recently by the Washington Supreme Court, for example, um, and, 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 I and I believe divided opinions. So I think it's an issue that I want to be very careful not to um, prejudge or, or, um, you know, or, or, and to, to maintain a completely open mind about. That said, the, the second way I'll answer it is um, my approach to law is, is a balance between law and equity. And so law is the rules, the clear rules, fair rules. Equity is um, looking at the particular circumstances and you know, is, there, is there true fairness uh, or not? And our legal system balances those things. Um, and whenever you're looking at doctrines such as standing, you always have to go back to first principles and understand what is the, what is the basis of that doctrine? And is it really being applied as it was intended or should, should be applied um, based on its underlying purposes? I appreciate your thoughtful answer. I, I, I'd want to have a longer conversation with you outside this interview. Uh, anybody else? I don't see any hands. Uh, there's Jeremy. Okay. Was muted. Um, uh, you just tell us. Um, you know, so you've uh, been a judge for a little, a little over six months. Uh, what do you find uh, the most rewarding part of uh, of your job, and what's uh, what's something that you are looking forward to if reelected? Thank you for that. Um, so in terms of what's most rewarding to me, at least in these six months, um, it has to, we, we don't get a lot of feedback on, on, on how we're doing, how, how good of judging we're doing or not doing or, or how people are experiencing the process. Um, and, and that's for a wide variety of reasons. But I think the most rewarding is um, the times that litigants, parties, have, have gone out of their way to thank me as a judge for putting in extra effort for making sure they're being heard. Uh, and, and oftentimes, regardless of how I'm ruling uh, on an issue, that's the most satisfying because that's when I know that I'm doing good work. Um, so uh, in terms of what I'm looking ahead to, as I get more comfortable in this role, then I, 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 can, I can do more and, and expand my horizons as, as previously mentioned. So community engagement being one piece. Um, I am involved in, in, in our courts committees, a couple of our courts committees, but getting more actively involved and then having seen more that can be more effective uh, in those other venues. Judge interviews tend to be difficult for us. They're not as political. Uh, so there's a couple minutes left and nobody has their hand up. Uh, I'm inclined to say, uh, follow up on the um, community engagement part and, and activity outside of being a judge and uh, go ahead and take a couple of minutes for that if you want. And that would be the end of the time. Sure. So I think there's a number of different ways that uh, a judge can engage the, the community, um, public speaking would be one, you know, panels, presentations, um, attending events that are designed to expose um, underprivileged communities to, to the legal system, uh, potential careers or pathways in the law. That's another example. Um, writing, writing in ways that are accessible and clear to, um, to different segments of the community. Um, engaging with different stakeholders to understand what's 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 happening in the community and to increase uh, uh, the judge's perspectives on the, all of which inform the issues that come before the court. But you know, the more so, it's it's a two way proposition. It's not just uh, teaching; it's also learning right? in, in terms of engaging the community. I will say that the I, I mentioned I had done different presentations as a practicing lawyer. Uh, and I did a number of different presentations in the years that I was practicing law, but I will say that the one that stood out by far was uh, one I did for the King County Public Library System, which was on our constitution and um, whether it could, could uh, serve as, as, as a foundation for us, for our society as we navigate uh, you know, all, the, all the difficult issues that we're, we're now facing. 
as a community and, and as a as a world. Um, and so that was the most satisfying and enjoyable one that I did. And I think it's uh, aligned with the types of engagement that a judge can and should be doing. And so I look forward to doing more of it. Okay, thank you very much. And as soon as the recording is turned off, we will go back to the mechanics.